is Stephen Brown. I'm the Assistant Director of Outreach for the Jackson Get to College Center, which is a part of the Woodward Hines Education Foundation, which is a nonprofit that helps Mississippi students plan and pay for college. So if that means ACT prep, like we're focusing on today, if that means uh, helping you get in touch with recruiters, helping you build your high school resume, helping you figure out what it is you want to major in, helping you find, um, helping you complete the applications to get federal and state financial aid, anything that involves helping Mississippi students get into college and find the money to pay for it, that's what we do. And all of our services are 100% free. So there are no hidden fees, there are no cash registers in our building whatsoever. All we are uh, trying to do is help students get into college and find the money to pay for it. But our focus this morning is going to be ACT. So one of the first things that we need to understand is what the ACT even is. So when it was created, the ACT was intended to be the test you take in America to get into college. So when it was created, what do you think those three letters stood for, ACT? If you said, American college test, brilliant. The test you take in America to get into college, American college test, yes. That's what those letters stood for. Now they don't stand for anything because they do a bunch of stuff, not just this one particular test. But now that we know what uh, the ACT is, it's important that we know how colleges are using it. Why are teachers, counselors, administrators, parents making such a big deal about this test, okay? Well, colleges are using your ACT score for three main things. The first thing is admission which means whether or not you even get into school. Colleges can say you have to have this ACT score to get into our school, okay? Um, there are eight public universities in the state of Mississippi, eight of them, okay? So there's Jackson State, Alcorn State University, Mississippi Valley State University, University of Southern Miss, uh, University of Mississippi or Ole Miss, Mississippi State, Delta State, and Mississippi University for Women. Those are the eight public universities in the state of Mississippi. If you have at least a 16 on the ACT and a 2.5 GPA, that's good enough to get into any of those schools. Okay, that's good enough to get an acceptance letter to any of those schools. 16 on the ACT, 2.5 GPA in your college prep curriculum. Okay, but beyond just getting into the school, because what happens is students will apply to these schools and they'll have those scores. You get an acceptance letter and that's great. Your family celebrates, everybody's happy. You got an acceptance letter. But beyond just getting into the school, we also have to do what? Pay for it, exactly, okay? So that's the second thing schools are using your ACT score for, scholarships. And those scholarships are gonna vary depending on what school you go to, okay? For example, we're here in Jackson. The two closest community colleges are Holmes Community College and Hines Community College. Okay? At Holmes, if you have a 20 on the ACT, it's full tuition. Full tuition at Holmes Community College with a 20 on the ACT. Now, Hines is another community college, same type of degree program, same type of classes, but they don't have that same scholarship. They have a different ACT score that you would need to get full tuition. Uh, you'd have to have a, a 25 before you got $1,500 per semester, which is just about going to cover your full tuition, um, maybe a little bit left. Also, at, Miss, at Mississippi Delta Community College, if you have an 18 on the ACT, that pays your full tuition. So it totally just varies depending on what school you go to. If you already know what school you're interested in, you've already applied and been accepted, the next thing you need to find out is, okay, well, what ACT score is it going to take to get their highest scholarship? because you might be one or two points away, okay? The best thing to do is talk to the recruiter directly to find out what you would need to get the highest scholarship because now we have a new goal, all right? Um, now, the third thing that colleges are using your ACT score for is called class placement, class placement. And what do you think I mean when I say that, okay? So if you guessed the classes that you're being placed in, you're correct, okay? So on the ACT, when colleges see your, uh, your score, they don't just see your overall score, which is called your composite score, but they're gonna see each subject area broken down. Okay, those are called your subscores. So we know we have uh, the four main subjects on the ACT, English, Math, Reading, and Science. Okay, there is a fifth optional writing section, but I want everybody in here to hear me clearly. If you are going to college in the state of Mississippi, you do not have to take the writing section. The writing section is not required for any university or community college, public or private, in the state of Mississippi, okay? It won't boost your score if you take it. It won't decrease your score if you don't take it. It is not used for any college in Mississippi. 
However, how many of you all might possibly want to go out of state? Okay, so if you are considering going out of state, you need to find out from that school directly if they require the, write, the writing section of the ACT. Some of them will, some of them won't. Truthfully, of, there are thousands of colleges in the nation, and of those, of those thousands of colleges, only about 23 of them are still even requiring the writing section of the ACT. So it's best to find out if they're gonna require it or not before you just pay for it and take it. Okay, but otherwise, if we're staying in the state of Mississippi, it's those four main subject areas, English, math, reading, and science. Now let's say my student, Sally, is great at English. She's awesome at English. So on the English section of the ACT, Sally scores a 34. That's really good, right? Because the highest score that we can make is what? Right, a 36, okay? So that's almost perfect, that looks great. So that looks great for English, plus it's gonna bring up her overall average or her composite score. But let's just say that Sally kind of struggles when it comes to math. So on the math section of the ACT, Sally scores a 14 or a 15. Her college is gonna say, okay, Sally, that's great, your English score is so high, but it looks like you might have some trouble when it comes to math, so we don't feel comfortable putting you in the freshman level math class, which would be college algebra, we feel like we'd be setting you up to fail. And that doesn't look good for you or us if you're failing classes. So actually, Sally, what we think we want you to do is take some what are called remedial or intermediate math classes to prepare you for college algebra so that you do better at it and that you'll be more successful, okay? So those remedial classes, you have to take them. You have to pass them. You have to pay for them just like any other class at that school, but they will not count as credits towards your graduation. You get zero credit for remedial classes. So think about it. If I start off my college career taking classes that don't even count, is it likely that I'll still graduate in eight semesters? Probably not. So if I have to go to school for extra years or extra semesters, that means I also have to do what? Pay for them, okay? So. That's why uh, class placement, like I said, is being your ACT score is being used to place you in classes based on those subscores. But it's not fair for me to just share the downside of class placement without sharing the bright side. I'll share my own personal testimony. I hate math with all of my heart and soul. I hate math, and it hates me right back. So I was thinking when I was in college, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to be really smart. I'm going to choose whatever major will allow me to take the least amount of math classes. Okay, so I chose communications. So public relations, advertising, journalism, that kind of stuff, I can do that all day long. Okay, so for my major, I had one required math class, which was college algebra. Now, don't ask me how this happened. I don't know. I didn't cheat. I didn't bribe anybody, nothing of the sort. But when I took the ACT, when I was in high school like you, on the math section, somehow or another, I scored a 25. So my college said, okay, wait a minute, Steven. You only need one math class for this major, but you got a 25 on the math section of the ACT? Don't even worry about taking that class. We'll just give you credit for it. So I tested out. I was exempt from it, and in four years of college, I never took one single math class just because of the ACT. So not only will it determine if you have to take extra classes that don't even count that you still have to pay for, but you can get credit for stuff you didn't even take because of this one test. So it's worth it to do your best on all four subject areas and not just focus on the one that you're deficient in or just focus on your strengths, but you really wanna to try to improve your score across the board and bring up all those subscores to add to the composite, okay? So <clears throat> also, uh, I wanna share with you that the ACT is not an IQ test. It is not a test of how smart you are. I know it seems like we're putting a lot of weight on the ACT, but in no way is it a test of how smart you are. You know all the ACT is? The ACT is a test of how well you can take the ACT. It's a test of how well you can take the ACT. Because some of you guys have great grades. You make, uh, you score really well on your, on your tests in class, and you have really good daily grades. You have an awesome GPA, but for some reason, you're stuck at the same ACT score that you have been for the last few months or eight, maybe even few years. For some reason, when it comes to standardized tests, you freeze up, or you have test anxiety, or you have time management issues, okay? All, that could all just be in your approach. 
That's why in this workshop, we want to make sure that you're approaching the ACT and the different subjects in the most uh, effective way so that you can score higher on the test. I'm truthfully not here to teach you math, I'm not here to teach you English. I'm here to show you how to approach the ACT in the most effective way that's going to help increase your score, okay? <clears throat> So that's why it's worth it, not only to pay attention the whole time, but also to take notes on this stuff, and more so than anything, you have to practice. You have to practice, okay? If uh, there are any student athletes in the room, um, let's say there's somebody that plays basketball, and I want you to think about this. Was there ever anyone in your life that showed you the correct way to shoot? I showed you you spread your fingers and flick your wrist to get that rotation on the ball, right? But the only way you're ever gonna get better at shooting is if you do what? Practice. Practice, your, practice shooting free throws until your arm gets tired. Just making sure you're holding your hands the correct way. All we're doing is showing you the form. We're showing you how to approach the test, but it's gonna be totally up to you to actually practice and work through this stuff, okay? Another thing that I'll say uh, in terms of practice, if, um, if you are a football player, would you practice football on a baseball field? Probably not, right? Why not? Because those are not the conditions that you're gonna be playing in. So you want to practice in the same conditions you're gonna be playing in. So for those of you who have taken the ACT before, the last time you took it, did you have a bowl of cereal right next to you? Did you have your cell phone out? Was the TV on, okay? Were you sitting on your bed? Probably not. So you know, you, you know what type of environment you're going to be in when you take the ACT. It's going to be cold. You're going to be tired. You're going to be hungry. It's just you and that test, okay? So I would really encourage you to try to simulate that same kind of environment. Just a quiet space, a desk with you, the test, and some scratch paper, maybe your calculator, okay? Um, so once again, you're practicing in the same conditions that you're going to be playing in, okay? Now this chart shows you the different ACT scores and how many questions you'd have to get right in each subject area to, uh, to earn that score. Now we already said the highest score you can make is a 36, correct? Okay. So the national average is about a 2021. That's the national average ACT score, about a 2021. Okay. Now the uh, average in Mississippi, last time I checked, was an 18.4. 18.4, and that is actually 50th in the country. There are only 50 states in the country. But that's about to change this year though, right? Right? Okay, so let's say uh, my friend here, Jeffrey, has, is taking a math class this year. Let's say Jeffrey's taking geometry. In Jeffrey's geometry class, if he were to get half of the questions right on a test, what would his grade be? If you guess 50, that's correct. You get all of them right, you make 100. You get half of them right, you make a 50, okay? His grade would be a 50. So is that passing or failing? Right, that's failing, okay? But look at the ACT math. There are 60 questions. If you just got about half of them right, that'll put you at about a 20 on the math section. That'll give you a 20 on the math section. If you just got about half of the questions right, okay? So really the odds are in your favor. And I'll show you a quick trick in a minute of how we can increase our chances and our likelihood of getting to at least half of the questions correct on the math section, okay? Now, um, like I said, that will get you a 20. Now I told you a second ago about a scholarship that you could get at a certain school if you had a 20. Anybody remember what it was? Correct, at Holmes Community College, if you have a 20 on the ACT, they'll give you full tuition, okay? But there's another scholarship that you guys should know about. Are any of you, uh, by show of hands, familiar with the HELP grant? H-E-L-P, the HELP grant, okay? So what the HELP grant is, that's the Higher Education Legislative Plan for Needy Students. The Higher Education Legislative Plan for Needy Students. It's from the Mississippi Office of uh, Financial Aid. Mississippi Office of Student Financial Aid. Okay, so if you have at least a 20 on the ACT, you have at least a 2.5 GPA, that's in your college prep curriculum, you've taken the necessary classes to graduate, you meet the IHL required curriculum, okay, 
plus one advanced elective, and your parents make below a certain income, the house, uh, excuse me, the HELP grant will pay your full tuition all four years to any, full tuition and fees all four years to any public school in the state of Mississippi. Full tuition and fees to any public school in the state of Mississippi. Okay, so if that means Ole Miss, if that means Jackson State, if that means Delta State, if that means USM, if that means one of the community colleges, all those schools that we listed earlier, plus our 15 uh, community colleges in the state, full tuition and fees for four years, okay? Now, if you are planning to go to a private school, it'll pay up to the tuition of the closest public school. So for example, if you want to go to Millsaps College, it'll pay up to the tuition of Jackson State at Millsaps. If you wanted to go to USM, it'll pay up to the tuition, excuse me, if you wanted to go to William Carey, it'll pay up to the tuition of USM at William Carey, okay? It'll pay up to the tuition of the closest public school at any private school, okay? Um, so like I said, 20 on the ACT, 2.5 GPA, you're taking the necessary classes and your household income meets the, the required uh, level and I can explain to you what that is. If you are the only child in the household, and by a show of hands, how many of you are the only child in your household? Okay. If you are the only child in your household, the most that your household income could be is $39,500 or less. $39,500 or less. Now, for every sibling in the household that is under the age of 21, okay, so even siblings that are living at college will still count as part of the household, okay? For every, every one of those siblings, you can add $5,000 to that number. So if you have a younger brother who's a sophomore in high school and an older sister who's a sophomore in college, then your parents can make up to $49,500 or less, okay? I was working with a student the other day who had seven siblings. Well, seven times five. Right, 35,000, so 35,000 plus 39,500, that's 74,500 dollars or less. As long as her parents make within that income range, she has a 20 on the ACT, 2.5 GPA in her college prep curriculum and meets the, uh, the curriculum requirements, full tuition and fees all four years to any public school in the state, okay? Now, like I said, that's the HELP grant, but did you know that there's a scholarship you can get if you just had a 15 on the ACT? It's absolutely correct. Okay, it's called MTAG, Mississippi Resident Tuition Assistance Grant. Mississippi Resident Tuition Assistance Grant, MTAG. And if you um, score at least a 15 on the ACT and have at least a 2.5 GPA, MTAG will pay $500, excuse me, $500 per year for your first two years and then $1,000 per year for your junior and senior year. Okay, that's called MTAG. There's one that's a bit more competitive uh, called MESG or Mississippi Eminent Scholars Grant, and you would need at least a 29 on the ACT and a 3.5 GPA in order to, uh, to get that grant. And by the way, those last two, MTAG and MESG, there's no income requirement for those. Okay, your parents could be billionaires. If you score at least 15 on the ACT and have a 2.5, you qualify for MTAG. Score at least a 29 and have a 3.5, you qualify for MESG. And MESG, I don't know if I said it, is $2,500 per year instead of just the 500 like MTAG is, okay? So in addition to uh, qualifying for those scholarships, you have to maintain that GPA and you have to be enrolled and passing at least 15 hours per semester in order to receive any of those three grants from the state of Mississippi, okay? Um, BS and you can only receive the, the biggest one that you qualify for. So although if you qualify for MESG and you have a 29 and a 3.5, obviously you have a 15 and a 2.5 also, but you can only get the largest of those three grants that you qualify for, okay? So now what we're gonna do is move away from, from the overview to uh, start talking about some strategies that can be applied to the entire test before we start breaking down each subject individually. Okay, so the first one, you've heard of this one a million times before, POE, or process of elimination. But what does it mean to use the process of elimination? Right, it means to cross out the ones that you know for sure cannot work, and the only thing you're going to be left with is the correct answer. But you start by crossing out the ones that you know for sure cannot work. 
Okay, and when you do that, and I know you've heard of it a million times, but we have to think about are we really applying that when we take the ACT? Because on the ACT, I want you to keep in mind this test is entirely multiple choice. The whole test is multiple choice. One of the answer choices has to be correct. Okay, one of the answer choices has to be correct. So if most of the sections have four answer choices, starting off, what are my percentage chances of getting the right answer? Correct. 25%, okay? So if I can eliminate two of the dumb answers, now my chances are what? 50-50, right? Okay, so I'm not wasting time by using the process of elimination. What I'm actually doing is increasing my chances of finding the right answer. And once we get to each section, I can show you how to actually apply that strategy so we can increase our chances, okay? But that's Poe. Now, another one that I want you to be familiar with is something called substitute to simplify. Substitute to simplify. And I can show you what I mean better than tell you. Um, how many of you have seen this word before? Anybody seen that word before? Some of you have? Yes, no? Oh, so most of you have never heard of this word before. Carnivorous forticus splenae. Okay, that's because I just made it up. It's not a real word. It's not even a real word, okay? But how many of you have taken a biology class before? Okay, and so you know how you have the genus and species name for a plant or animal, and it's always some weird Latin word like this? Okay, let me tell you a secret about the ACT science test. It's not really a science test. It's not. If you can read a graph, you can do well on the ACT science test. You don't have to be great at physics, you don't have to be great at biology, you don't have to be great at chemistry. If you can read a graph, you can do well on the ACT science test, okay? So, the point is, when I see these long, complicated words, so I want you to think about it. On the science section, for those of you who have taken the ACT before, you know the science section is the last section of the test. So by this time, you're tired, you're hungry, your head is hurting, you're cold, okay? You've been staring at this test for the last few hours, and the last thing you need is some long, complicated word like this that's going to slow you down. But this is my point. You don't have to know what these words mean. You don't even have to be able to pronounce them. All you need to be able to do is distinguish one word from another so that you can read a graph, okay? So when I see those long, complicated words on the ACT, rather than focusing on that, what I'm just gonna do is cross that word out and I'm gonna write in cat, dog, shoe, fish. It doesn't matter what you write in, you're crossing out the long, complicated words, writing in something simple so you can focus on the context of what the question is asking and not get caught up in the terminology, okay? The words don't matter. Cross out the, those big words, write in something simple, focus on the context of what the question is asking and not get caught up in the terminology, okay? So I'll give you an example. Look at this example, okay? Starting at researchers. Researchers study the beak depth of two species of finches, Geospiza fortis and Geospiza fuliginosa, both species. Okay, I'm already confused, right? Do you see what I'm saying? You know what this entire paragraph is trying to tell us? That we have two kinds of birds in three islands. One bird lives here, one bird lives here, they both live here together. That's all we really need to know from this paragraph. You have two kinds of birds and three islands. One bird lives here, one bird lives here, they both live here together, okay? But if this is the last part of the test, and I'm already tired, I'm already fatigued, I'm already ready to go, and I see these long, complicated words, all it's gonna do is slow me down and distract me from the context of what the question is trying to tell me. Bird one and bird two, red and blue, cat and dog, it doesn't matter what words you write in, just write in something simple Cross out those big words, write something simple. You can focus on the context, what the question is asking, and don't get caught up in the terminology. Once again, that is called substitute to simplify. Substitute to simplify. Okay, so another thing that um, we want to pay attention to on the ACT is the order of difficulty. The order of difficulty. So um, there, you'll have three different 
difficulty levels of questions on the ACT. You have easy questions, medium questions, and hard questions. Okay? Easy questions, medium questions, and hard questions. What's very important for you to know is that all of these questions are virtually around the same amount of points. They're all worth around the same amount of points, okay? So if you know that going into the test, and the issue that a lot of people have isn't that you don't know how to do any other stuff on the test, it's that you get stuck on some stuff that's too hard and you end up, and you end up running out of time. Well, if you know there's a likelihood that you're gonna run out of time, but you also know that the questions are worth about the same amount of points, wouldn't it make sense to just do all the easy stuff first? So for that reason, we'll break them down into these three different categories. Do now, do later, do never. Do now, do later, do never, okay? So when we say do now, I mean those are the easy questions. It's simple, it's baby work, you can fly through it, you know the answer immediately. You always start with those questions first. Rack up on those easy points, okay? Rack up on those easy points. Okay, but there are gonna be some that you know how to do, but might take you a little bit longer. You might have to compare information from two different graphs. You may have to do a little bit of extra reading. You might have to uh, work your problem out on your paper, okay? Those that you know how to do, but are gonna take you a little bit longer, you can come back to those. Get the easy stuff out of the way first. Come back to those medium questions. But then there's gonna be some stuff that is just flat out too hard for you. It's flat out too hard for you. We said a second ago that, I don't know, what is his name, Jeffrey or whatever? Jeffrey is taking geometry. Well, there's going to be a couple of trigonometry problems on the ACT. If Jeffrey's never had trigonometry, would it make sense for him to spend 20 minutes staring at a trig problem trying to figure it out? No, you're not supposed to know how to do that. How would you know how to do that, okay? So rather than Jeffrey spending 20 minutes staring at that trig problem or you staring at a problem that you know for a fact that you do not know how to do, and it's too difficult for you, you get those problems that are either taking you too long or they're too hard, what you should do is do never. Do never. And what do you think I mean when I say do never? When I say do never, I mean you are going to use your spot of the day. You're going to use your spot of the day. That means when I walk in that morning to take the ACT, I'm making up my mind right then before we even get started. Okay, anytime I get to a problem and I have no clue what the answer is, or the person who's administering the test says we only have two minutes left, I'm going to bubble in B or D or C or A. It doesn't matter what letter you pick, but pick one and stick with it the whole time. So don't make a Christmas tree, don't spell abacadabra, nothing like that. No, pick one letter, stick with it the entire time because thinking about it, think about it. Even if I'm just blindly guessing, if I don't even open my test booklet, if I don't have a clue what the answer is, I still have at least what? A 25% chance of getting it right. Exactly. So if you know for a fact that, um, like I said, you do not know what the answer is. Choose your spot of the day, bubbling in. So I want you to understand something. For those of you who have taken the ACT before, and last time you took it and you scored a 17, and you know you left a bunch of stuff blank because you didn't know how to do it, or you scored an 18 because you ran out of time and didn't get to finish it, you probably could have guessed your way to a 20. Truthfully, you probably could have guessed your way to a 20. So for that reason, you never, ever want to leave a question blank. Never leave a question blank on the ACT, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, there's a few more details that I want you to know about the ACT. I don't know if anybody has taken it in, um, in April, June, or December. How many of you guys are familiar with TIR? TIR, okay? So what that is is test information release. Test information release. The ACT offers a service called test information release, where um, if you take the April, June, or December test, they give you the option to pay an extra $22, or it's $23.54 with tax, okay? And if you take one of those tests, they'll actually send you back your entire test booklet. You see all the questions, which ones you missed, and what the right answer should have been. So you know exactly what you need to study before you go take the test again. You'll see exactly what types of questions you're missing. So instead of just saying, oh, my math score was low, I need to bring up my math, what does that even mean? 
you can see, okay, well, it looks like I did well on the algebra problems, but I missed a lot of geometry questions, so I know I need to go back and study my formulas before I take the test again, okay? Like I said, that service is available during the month, if you take the ACT in April, June, or December, the national test dates in April, June, or December. So, <clears throat> like I said, that's going to be one of the most valuable services that you can take advantage of. People are paying hundreds of dollars for tutors. This costs $22. You can see exactly what you missed. And uh, so you'll know, what, like I said, what you really need to focus your studies on before you take the test again. Now, there are some changes uh, coming to the ACT as of September 2020, from whenever you're watching this. Um, for one, uh, there will be an online option for the ACT to, to take the test on a computer, uh, like totally computer-based. And if you do take that option to take the computer-based test, then your score results will be uh, given to you within 48 hours. So that's a really, uh, really good service. Also, the ACT um, will provide you with a super score, meaning that you took several different tests and they'll say, okay, well, this was your highest math section back in April of 2018 and this was your highest English section in June of 2019. And they'll take your four highest uh, subscores across your entire time of taking the ACT and produce a what's called a super score, okay? The uh, third change, and this is one of, the, one of the really big ones also, is that they will allow you to retest just on one particular subject area. Okay, perhaps you did well on your English, your reading, and your math, but you got burned out by the time you took the science section. So while the other sub scores are pretty high, your science section does not truly reflect your abilities and you just want to retake that one particular section. It will allow you on a national test date to retake just that one particular section, okay? And um, as of the date of this video, they have not already uh, release what the, the cost will be for that service, but just know that it will be available as well, okay? So at this point, like I said, we've summed up our, um, our intro and all the things that we need to know about the ACT as an overview. What I'm actually gonna do is make sure that we have gotten all the information. So. We also have a, uh, an ACT quiz that we're gonna go through really quickly just to make sure that you have understood and learned all the, the main strategies that you need to know from the intro. So it's just a few really easy questions. The first one, the highest score you can make on the ACT is a 36, is that true or false? Of course, that is true, okay? What does PO stand for? PO stands for process of elimination. The harder questions on the ACT are worth more points than the easy questions. Is that true or false? That is false, okay? They're worth about the same. What is the name of the strategy where you cross out the long, complicated words and replace them with simpler words? That's called substitute to simplify. Substitute to simplify. The three categories the ACT questions are broken into are do now, do later, and do never. Uh, the state of Mississippi offers a scholarship for an ACT score of 15. Is that true or false? That is true. It's called MTAG. Remember, 15 on the ACT, 2.5 GPA. That's $500 per year for your first two years, then $1,000 per year for your junior and senior year. Students will lose points for every incorrect answer marked on the ACT. So if you don't know the answer, you should leave it blank. That is false. You never leave a question blank on the ACT. What are the three things colleges will use your ACT score for? Okay, that's admissions, scholarships, and class placement. Admissions, scholarships, and class placement. How many public universities are in the state of Mississippi? There's eight. Eight public universities, seven private universities, and 15 community colleges. What is the minimum ACT score required for admission into any public university in Mississippi? 16 on the ACT, okay? 2.5 GPA in your college prep curriculum. All students that attend college outside of Mississippi are required to take the writing section of the ACT. 
that is false because it says all, okay? Some of them will, some of them will not. Best way to find out is talk to the recruiter directly. And once again, that's something we can help you with. If you don't know who your recruiter is, you can just ask us and we can put you in contact with the recruiter from any college. It doesn't just have to be in Mississippi. Students that attend college in Mississippi are not required to take the writing section of the ACT. That is true, okay? Uh, because they will yield no credit hours toward graduation, remedial classes are free to freshman students. That is false. You still got to pay. A 26 on the ACT will earn a full ride scholarship to any college in Mississippi. That is false. That is definitely false. Some of the, some of the schools uh, don't even start awarding students for their ACT score until at least a 23. So those change uh, from year to year. So I'll find out from your school directly what their ACT requirements are. When ACT questions are too difficult or will take too long to complete, students should do never, which means to use your spot of the day. Use your spot of the day, okay? So uh, that sums up the, the overview of the intro uh, and just the general strategies for the ACT. And at this point, we'll start to break down each subject individually. <music>